Hello, and welcome to another installment of Pi Game. Um, what we're going to do is continue with the moving the image tutorial, which is available at Pi Game or Docs, Tut, Move It. And that would be if you go to, uh, let's see if we go here, the front page, Pi Game front page for the documents. And then you scroll down a little ways, and it's tutorials. How do I move an image? And if you've been following along, you're already here, so that's good. And what we've already done in the previous installment was basically gone through this and done a slightly or fancy version of it all. And we made the screen list that has like these one and twos represent uh, background tiles, like little textured tiles for you know, the ultra simplistic game. Sorry about that. There's just a little bit of background noise. Wanted to close that up. So yeah, we're just going through a screen list here and um, we drop a player in and this was all character based and we of course added graphics to it and just did a graphical version of the same kind of thing here. But we basically were just able to drop a player in and we were doing the blit to write the player then we would um, erase the player, move the position, and then re-blit the player, re -blit the player um, erase and replace with the background, move the position, and so on, and re-blit. So when we get down here, this still this should be pretty familiar. If your eyes glaze over, don't worry about it too much. There's just just to run through it. It's basically establishing the background. Um, and they're kind of like doing their, we didn't follow along exactly with this, but then there was uh, just basically setting up the screen blank, and then in the screen was copying the background, not the most efficient method they're using there. And then they're printing the screen, which just prints this little list in text mode, but of course we were printing it graphically, and then uh, we're, they were hard coding the player position at three, dropping in the player at that position, and then printing the screen with eight there to show the player, and then they kind of move them around and stuff and uh, tell us what a blit is, all that stuff. I don't want to re-bore you with those details. So then we get down here and it got a little bit fancier. Um, but anyway, we'll get down here to where we're at, around this area, and I'm going to try and catch up and uh, explain as I go. So the first thing I'm going to do, instead of just doing that regular import pie game statement, which is nice and simple, and then after that we did an in, or a pie game dot init. Um, that's really nice and simple, but it's also pretty inefficient. So we're going to just bring in what we what we want and not too much else. So from Pygame import, we needed the display and image modules. And by doing this, we don't have to type pygame.display da, 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 or pygame.image.load or any of that. So it saves us a lot of typing too. And then also from Pi, uh, Pi Game Locals, we're going to import everything. And that's just basically all the constants and stuff that get used. We'll see how that fits in in a little bit. But basically, this is like for a little efficient module of your own, this is kind of like a little bit of a pattern to follow. And you really shouldn't be bringing in too many um, individual imports up here so if you are that's a sign that maybe you need to divide your program up and break it up into a couple different more modules and that goes with a lot of library usages and stuff as well okay and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring that screen uh, initial well first I better initialize the display so what we're doing here is we're initializing the display independently any of the modules that need initialization you can do those independently instead of doing pi game init and then it initializes like a half dozen modules you can just specifically initialize the ones you want to use so we're just going to display in it because the image doesn't need an init displays the only module we'll use to, uh, for this session that will require initialization and then we'll create a screen variable and we'll and notice we're not typing pi game anymore in front of it which is nice we'll do a display set mode and we'll just set that just like we had it before 600 by 100 and that should do that and then just like before we'll bring in our player and that will be an image load and no pi game in front of that either of course and then that will be player.png just like before and then I'll just 
copy that, bring that down. And then the ground texture tiles from before, which was ground A. Oops. And then ground B. Okay, and then of course that background list, which is actually a tuple to make it a little more efficient. And it's gonna have each respective ground tile at its uh, position that we want it at. There's three, four, five, six, just like we did before. And that will be B, A, or no, that was A, right? Try and keep it consistent with what we had going. B, B, A. Pretty sure that's what it was. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and hit F5 and run it and just make sure I don't get any errors thrown out at me. Cool. It's looking good. So I'm just going to click back here in this window, then hit Alt F4 to close all that stuff out and get back here. And now. We can go ahead and blit the background. So since there's six tiles that need to get blitted across that little window we just saw, we'll say four. And I'm going to call them tile this time since they're a tile. But to call it I is probably a little more pop, uh, a little more correct, like appropriate in this situation. But uh, anyway, it's your own preference for tile in the range, the length of the background. Like I said, that could just be I for like an index value because we're effectively going to use this uh, to index into the background to get each one of these tiles in the respective position. So we'll say screen dot lit. This is going to be a lot of stuff that we've just seen. So background. And if you used an I, it would go right there, right? But we're being a little bit more readable and saying tile. And then that's going to be it in a tuple that's tile by the width of the tile on the first row. And then we'll do display dot update this time instead of flip. Updates basically just a slightly higher level version and higher level doesn't mean like harder or anything crazy like that. It just means slightly higher abstraction level. So uh, display flip will, is only appropriate for some circumstances. I don't believe it's appropriate for software rendering. So display update should automatically call the, the most efficient software rendering to update the, the display. And otherwise, it will fall back to display flip if it's a, the proper hardware surface. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and use now. And then we'll go ahead and run this. And we should get the uh, background tiles painted pretty much instantly and shown on the screen. And there they are. And this time you'll notice I have a little outline. That's not a glitch or anything. What that is is I went in with uh, paint and I just, well, on the closest inside pixel there, I just drew on the brown tiles, I drew a black square around them and on the green tiles, I drew a white square. And you'll notice the borders a little bit thicker in between the same color tiles because there's effectively, you know, a one pixel by and then a one pixel. So it's doubled up to show that they're budding each other. And then right here we have a black pixel and then a white pixel. So that's the kind of I, and the reason I did that was to make sure that I wasn't off by one, which I was on some of my calculations and stuff that I was messing around with. So that's why the tiles are a little bit uglier, but you know, that's something you might want to do too, is just have some little like uh, test tiles to make sure that, you know, everything's in order the way you're expecting it. So you should get that border all the way around each, each tile there. And I can actually zoom in with the magnifier. I don't know for sure if this will show up right on the video, if it's got like some direct X optimization or not, but you can see there's the one, black pixel right there all the way around this tile and then right here it's doubled up because each one of those tiles has a black pixel going down and all the way and the same thing with the white and black pixel there and uh, the double white pixel and then over here I think was where I was having an issue so I have my one my pixels all the way down around the corner right 
So I'm going to click in the background, hit Alt F4 to close that back out. Okay, so that just about catches us up to where we were, except of course I haven't put the player in yet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit tricky. Not too crazy. We're, um, I'm going to just do an infinite while loop, which is the game loop. This is pretty common. And we'll tab all this over so that it becomes block statements in that while loop. And we'll, uh, or this isn't a block statement. It becomes statements within the while block, I guess I should say. So that's still going to do everything. And now it's going to sit there and do it infinitely. So if I ran it, you wouldn't really notice a difference besides maybe some more CPU usage or something. So it's now running in an infinite loop. My cursor's that fist. That means that it, um, it's kind of like the hourglass basically. So, and then my CPU fan just spun up because it's just running as fast as it can infinitely repainting those background tiles and redisplaying them. Okay, so now I need to go ahead and drop the character in. And I want to do that right after, right here, right after it paints that background. So of course this isn't the most efficient way to paint the background in, but for right now, just to step it up a notch, this is how we're going to do it. We don't have a huge background or anything too crazy, so it's not a big deal. Screen dot blit, and then we're going to blit the player in here. And the player is going to be at a position. So we'll come up here and we'll say position is going to be at zero, which will effectively be that far left top corner side thing. And then uh, we'll give it a direction too, which some people call velocity or uh, in that last tutorial, they called it speed and stuff. So that anyway, that's just, it's like a flag or a multiplier or a, an addition it's just we're going to add that to our position and then when we want to go back the other way we'll flip it and make it negative and then add that negative number which is effectively just subtracting one and we'll do screen bit player position and then we need to add that times 100 still because that way that the position doesn't just literally move by one pixel at a time we want to move that entire 100 pixels to the next tile and st we're staying on row zero still throughout this one as well. And so that will blit the player on the first tile. We can go ahead and just run it to make sure it's working so far. And there it is. Doesn't do anything fancy. It just sits there. So close all that out. And so what we want to do now, what we can do is add the keyboard control in. And to do that, I'll come up here and I'll add, I like to keep stuff in alphabetical order if I can, so I'll put event right there. And then I'll come down here again and I'll check for a keyboard event. So we'll say, uh, was it four E in, and remember not to call it event because especially if you do it like I've done it right here with this four or from Pygame import event because then it doesn't have that Pygame prefix. But if you are leaving, if you're doing it the old school way and just saying import Pygame and then everything's prefixed with Pygame, you can call that event. But a lot of times in a lot of programming languages to keep it short, um, an error in like a try catch or an event, they'll usually just do this anyway. So it's not a really bad practice or anything. For e in event dot get, and then it's if that the type of event is a key down then we want to check is that key a key left and if so then we want our position to decrement by one and otherwise is or give me one second let me type this key equals key right the exact opposite position it's incremented by one. And the reason I went ahead and did two ifs instead of an if else is because that way there's no short, uh, it doesn't short out and terminate quick on one and then do twice as much conditionals on the other, if that makes sense. That's something I learned like programming on 8-bit Atari was that like by the time you test for like all four key directions, it takes longer to test for that last key because it has to go through like three conditionals before it gets there and it's like oh okay but then 
you know, maybe if you test for the left key first, like we've done here, then it's really quick. So the little character will effectively move a lot quicker when you go left than it would right or whatever. But um, it's probably a lot less apparent on modern machines. But anyway, that's a practice that I stick to, to where you just, uh, you test no matter what, you test for all four of those up to four directions, right, or eight directions or whatever, so that they all have that same amount of delay effectively between them. Okay, so that should, that will test which way we want to move our player. So now instead of, um, we'll use that to increment our player here. Let me see if I haven't got lost myself yet here. So the player position, so that increments the position by one and there is that. So we want to test and make sure well, I guess we don't need to test yet. I'm just going to run it and see what where we're at with things. All right, it's working. Cool. I'm hitting the left and right keys. And I can go way off the screen. Like if I just go one off the screen, it only takes me one to get back. But if I go 10 off the screen, then I have to come 10 to get back. Like that. So that's the thing. Because we don't have a balance checker that's stopping us from going off the screen um behind the scenes you know it's just it will run it will run as far as you want to let it as far as you try and push it because it's just effectively spinning this variable value off to like negative infinity or positive infinity but our uh, display blitting will only show stuff that's within that you know that range of our tiles so that's what's going on there okay so that's cool, but how do we move more smoothly across this background now? And to do that, we'll go ahead and we'll get rid of all this here, the key movement stuff, because we're not going to use that for the rest of this session in that manner. And we'll say if the key, if it's quit or key down. And so this is just checking, this is a little Python trick to check within a list, right? And or a tuple. And it's saying, you know, if the event type is quit or a key down event. So basically if we click the X or press any key, then we're gonna just use that to quit. And we'll call sys.exit like that. And we need to make sure we import sys up here so that we have that functionality. And we can test that real quick. And so it's there, and you'll notice in the background here, I don't have a prompt because it's running through that while loop. So if I click the X, now we got our prompt back. But the window stays, and that's kind of like a feature so that we can uh, manipulate the window, of course, like we did in the last tutorial from this prompt. But we're not going to do that. I'm just going to hit all F4, close both of those windows out, and then come down here. And so now we want to move it just a pixel at a time. So instead of multiplying it, because I want to smoothly slide that character back and forth across our little map. So I'm going to get rid of the 100 pixel stepping right there. And I'm going to say, let's see where we're at. We're going to blit the player at first in position 0. Then we're going to say position. Um, increment the position in the direction whatever the current direction happens to be and right now it's one pixel forward and then we need to test and say if that uh, the position is less than zero or the position is greater than 500 then we know we've gone too far because right we have uh, six tiles six 100 pixel tiles and that top left corner would be at 500 plus 100 would be 600 so that would be as far as we'd want to go and so and then otherwise of course if it's zero we bounce to the 500 and potentially bounce back and then if it's below zero then we're sliding too far off that left edge so if it is and what we want to do is we want to take that direction and we want to effectively flip it so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply it times a negative one which we could just type minus direction and just that would be the statement but this one reads a little bit better so I'm going to do that direction equals direction times negative one effectively it's a little happy medium there and then if that was the case then that means that we would be at like a negative one right here right so we need to go ahead and correct that and say position plus equals 
the new direction in that case. So if that was a negative one, um, you know, we would have already been going negative in that case. And then this would say, hey, you're at negative one. So drop in here and multiply, you know, negative one times negative one and save that back to direction, which would be a positive one. And then it will say position equals position plus one. So that would bring it back to zero if it had gone too far. So I guess that must stick for a pixel. So there's probably a more efficient way to do that, but it's so quick you don't even notice with what I'm going at right now. Um, but yeah, always double check those. It's so easy to be off by one on stuff, like very easy. So definitely something to check if you're worried about it. Okay, and that's gonna do that. In theory, is this gonna work? Let's try it out. All right, we're moving. And then it's bouncing off each edge, back and forth. I have my frame rate set to 30 frames a second on the video, so I don't know how well it's gonna catch all of this stuff. This should be caught okay, but when I get it going a little bit faster, um, it, it might get a little bit weird. So if I review the video and I notice that it's really bad, then the next one I'll record at 60 frames a second. But I, I really like to avoid recording at 60 frames a second. I just find that really annoying because um, the resource usage for one is just crazy. It always spins up my CPU fan and stuff to watch video at that frame rate. So that's my reasoning behind that. I'm gonna bounce out of that and come back here and show you a little trick. So when I said before that it returned the surface up here by loading the image, and that was sort of like an internal format that was optimized and stuff for the most efficient handling that was sort of a half truth that's true you know it's like that's definitely something that it can handle better internally but it's not fully optimized because by the reason that I move this screen statement up here above these is because if you set your initializing to set your uh, display mode up here then you can pass this convert right here and that will really optimize what you're doing because it will optimize it for this these specific display settings that you happen to be using and just really get the most optimal surface it can so what will happen is image load will return a surface and then convert will take that surface and return an even more efficient surface to store and player so we'll do that we can do that with everything and I'm just using regular old convert there's also an alpha convert if you want to do uh, like GIF and PNG transparencies and stuff. And so that's that. We can't use it on the background just yet because the background's still a bunch of individual tiles, but they're optimized right here. They're op they are optimized individually, but there's nothing to apply to this list. Okay, so now if we run it, this is what might blow the frame rate on you because it's going a lot faster now, which is nice, but now we need to think about throttling it. And you can see like if I move my mouse, maybe you can tell it's slowing down. Um, if I load Task Manager, that's always a good example. It slows it to a crawl for a second. And then once it catches up, it will speed back up. Because what it's doing is it's just trying to use the entire core effectively. It's just trying to, to uh, use this whole core. So you can see it's at 16, it'll be up to like 25 in a second. If I just let it go, it should. Maybe it can't because I'm recording the with OBS Studio, so it's docking it by about 5% apparently. Okay. But I'll go ahead and stop that guy or gal or whatever. And uh, come back down here and check it out. What do we got going? All right. So what we can do is we can throttle that right here. And this thing talks about that. Where does it talk about that at? Down here, they have a time delay. Stop program for one tenth of a second. And what we can do is we can come up here to the very top and you can see time under the most useful. This whole list right here is like the most useful stuff across here and then below it's more advanced stuff and then the other stuff, which it's actually pretty nicely arranged. And what we're sticking to just a few things out of most useful stuff. So there's that time. Anything you want to look up in here, like, hey, what's locals? Hey, there it is. It's these constants for Pygame, you know, like anything you want to know is up here. Event, 
that event.get, usually there's like in most API documentation, you'll see like a uh, set of parentheses after these because they're methods or functions. But um, for some reason, they don't do that in here. So, but anyway, just know those aren't necessarily properties. They're usually methods or they're technically called functions in here because they're not attached to like a quote unquote object, even though a single uh, module is a singleton object. So you can think of it either way and you'll be fine. Um, so yeah, there's what it does. It just gets the events. And if you want to read in more detail about it and everything and see what other stuff is in the events module and everything, I just want to kind of introduce you to that. So if we go over to time, we can see there's the wait, delay and stuff like that. But there's this one right here called time.clock, Pygame time clock. And uh, you can see right here, it returns a clock object, a clock type object. And then it, the one we're interested in is this tick method within that object that's returned. Um, don't, try not to get too in over your head. You know, you have the whole Pi game package, and then you've got the time module, and then you've got the clock object, which has a tick method on it. So, whatever, it's easy to get confused. But what it is here is um, the thing we really care about is this uh, clock.tick function or method, and whatever you set that at, that will limit your frames per second so that they don't go overboard. And this is probably out of the simple options. This is like the smoothest way to do it. Those time delays are kind of janky and stuff. So what we'll do is we'll use that and we'll come over here and we'll need to add time to the end of this list. And then we'll come down here and just create a frame rate. Um, which is effectively that clock object and we'll do time dot clock like that and that will create a new clock object and it will save it to the, under the identifier name frame rate so frame rate is a time clock object which is what this tick method is attached to so if we come down here and we say frame rate dot tick and then we say uh, like 60 you know I don't think it's very accurate but and if you do anything over a thousand it just blows it out and it just is like you're not even using it again but I like a thousand personally so far with this tutorial so we'll go ahead and run that and now we can see it's moving a lot smo slower a little bit too slow so I'll go ahead and bump that up to a thousand. And now it's moving a lot quicker, fairly smooth. Okay. And then if I up it to a thousand one, you'll see that it just, it's like it wasn't even enabled again. So I'm gonna close that back out and put it back down to a thousand. Okay, so now we've got that smooth, pretty smooth movement at a reasonable speed. So that's cool. But that's, we can do one better on this. So let's go back here, kind of sync back up with the documentation. Time, back one more event, locals, I really dug in. Okay. There's all the stuff we've already done. So screen coordinates. This is where it's talking about using the rectangles that I kind of mentioned earlier in a tutorial. So this position right here, these are the top corner, effectively the top corner of a rectangle. And a rectangle is just pretty much like a square, right? But it doesn't have to be a perfect square. And uh, that, my mouse is freezing up again. That, um, so what we do is when we're blitting, it only really needs that top corner for this second parameter. And that's all it cares about. We're saying, hey, they're like, hey, where do you want that top left corner of whatever we're painting at? And then we'll just paint the rest. But what if, you know, we might not want it to just paint the rest for various reasons. One of them we're about to find out. And so that's what we can do instead of having this a bunch of background tiles that load in slightly clunky one at a time and stuff like that 
we can just get rid of that whole idea and bring in the background like I already went into a little paint program and created like a little bit more photorealistic version of the background as just one image same dimensions but one image still fairly crude and it's gonna be image dot load just like the others now and I just saved it as photoreal PNG and now we can come down on that screen blit and instead of doing this for we can get rid of this for loop so that will save us some cycles some serious cycles in a high level language like this and we can get rid of that index and we can even get rid of all this and now we're just going to do the position twice because the reason we're sending it the position twice is once for and this is the player position maybe I should do it up here first to make it a little more clear so I'm going to do screen blit again or initially background and then add just zero zero and what that's going to do I gotta do one for player also so what that's gonna do is that's gonna paint this 600 by 100 background that I've made in or cut out from a public domain image into glad I noticed that uh, and it's just gonna paint the whole thing starting at the top left corner at zero zero on our screen and then since the image just happens to line up with our exact screen dimensions it will all look like it was meant to be and that's sort of hard coded in right there because that works and then right here we need to change this to player and the player is going to be brought in at position and that's going to be this position zero right here but actually we need to say player dot there's a little since this is a surface and a surface is an object that means it has fancy methods attached to it so we can uh pi game documentation and go to the surface right here and then we can see there's like uh, pretty sure there's a lot of functions on surface so there's blit if we want to read about that one um scroll down here what are we looking for get rectangle or something it's not even in alphabetical order is it there it is get rect so get rectangle area of the surface returns a new rectangle covering the entire surface so it just gives you the dimensions of the image you loaded onto the surface effectively in that rectangle and in a rectangle go all the way back up there uh, you can see right here a rectangle consists of a top a top left corner and a width and a height so the top and the left or the left and the top in the order they appear are where that top left corner is going to appear on your display screen and then the width and the height are just an offset so they the width and the height is always going to stay the same like a, on our 100 by 100 tiles that's always going to be 100 comma 100 um, but that left and the top will of course change if that image is moving or in the case of the background we want to just specifically use the uh, we don't want to repaint the whole background every single time as a matter of fact I could do that real quick just to show how much slower that is it's not huge slow but it's kind of like the last thing without using the convert statements and stuff so we'll save that um, background player and the player positions now getting the player rectangle which is just going to return one of these uh, rect objects which consists like I said it just consists of those coordinates there for the most part and a few helper methods that are probably a lot I guess handful of helper methods and if you want to read more about it you can read all about rectangle objects and dig into those methods definitely not a bad idea um, and when you construct a rectangle if you ever do you can either just pass it the comma separated values individually or you can pass it two tuples or you can pass it another rectangle object to get a copy all that and anything that takes a rectangle as far as I know in a pie game you can just pretend like you don't have to type like rect and construct a rectangle right there and hand it you know if the method expects it already you can just give it 
these types any of these types of coordinates and it will automatically just create a rectangle it will know what to do with it and create a rectangle out of it for you so that's kind of handy um, player get rectangle so that's all we have to do that one time and then now we have just the coordinate you know it automatically knows we could have hard coded it and sent it a tuple that was like zero comma zero comma 100 comma 100 if we want but um, the thing we get with this is we actually get those methods too so that's the important well kind of important it's not super important for our purposes we could really just even get away without using the methods but we'll go ahead and start using them um, so that's going to set that position the direction flag will still need since we still want it to bounce back and forth we're going to blit that do all that so then down here we're going to screen blit the background we're going to do the player and the players now this is a position object effectively so we don't need all that extra coordinate and then the position some of this needs to get kind of bumped around a little bit so we're gonna split the player at the position which is already done up there the first time and then we're gonna check I think Now we're going to check that first coordinate is going to be that left, that upper left corner. So we're going to say, we're just going to index into that, just like that. Maybe not the very cleanest way to do it, but it works for now. And then, so we're just saying, hey, if that first um, element in the, that gets returned there is, um, you know, that's the same value we were effectively dealing with before. So then we need to flip the direction and then either way that position's going to equal um, well what we can do is we can call that move dot move like that on it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do move in place because otherwise we'd have to say position equals like that and it would return a copy of that rectangle every time but I think move in place should be a little bit more efficient because then it's just manipulating it without making a new copy and having to do garbage collection as much and stuff like that. Especially for a bunch of fast moving objects. So position, move in place. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move it in that direction and we're going to stay on that same uh, horizontal row. So move in that direction. And I might be off by one and over painting and stuff like this isn't the very best example, but it just for something fairly quick and simple, I think this illustrates the points of what's going on here. So we set the player position, we get that rectangle that should be 0, 0 by 100, 100, and then plus all the methods attached to it, then we've got our direction still hard coded. Um, we're going to blit the background at 0, 0, which will effectively paint out the whole thing. We're going to screen blit the player in this initial rectangular position, which everything should just be just like it was in the last one so far. Then we're checking for the quick key, entering that infinite loop, um, otherwise infinite loop. And then we're going to blit the background because even though this handles it initially, once we come in here, um, I'm not going to continue to blit the whole background. I'm just doing this for illustrative purposes. Otherwise, we could, of course, get rid of that. But once I get fix this up, it will only blit the part of the background that we're erasing the player from. So just to explain that, the screen blit player position is going to re-blit the player every single time. And we need to do that again because uh, the player will be erased effectively by this background each time through the loop. This is probably totally redundant right with the way I have it set up right now. I could put a display update or display flip or whatever right here and then this would be cool but I think I'll just go ahead and get rid of player position right there. And then right here it says if positions that go ahead and do that move direction so it's going to check um, after it blitz the player so the player will become painted on that hidden surface so to speak over that 
fresh background or at least refresh background and then uh, it's going to check and see if it needs to adjust the direction then it's going to move the player but it's not going to paint the player it's just effectively incrementing that that rectangle corner right here that left corner of the rectangle in uh, any direction if it needs to and then it's going to update the display but it's going to be effectively updating it with these two blitz up here and then of course it will wait and try and sync it to something a little smooth to see so let's see what I did wrong so far or maybe coincidentally got everything all right wow it's working so you can see a little bit more photorealistic background that's just kind of like to illustrate the fact that like now we're not sort of bound by generic tiles we could I tried to make it kind of mimic the old background you know like a brown brown green 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 brown um, and you can see right here there's like a little line just because I cut and paste that but that's not exactly a hundred by hundred this is actually like closer to 110 or something so it, it, none of that matters that's just more of like a photorealistic image and there it is bouncing back and forth fairly smoothly if I wasn't doing video and stuff it'd be a little bit quicker right so what else is there here let me go back over to this tutorials one so the screen coordinates with the rectangle welcome to read that yourself of course I think I explained it reasonably well changing the background and like it says right here you're passing the optional third rec okay that's what we need to do so this will make it run even faster glad I didn't forget about that so what we're gonna do here is pass it the position which this will be that upper left corner of where to paint it and then we're also gonna pass it this one and it will this will tell it for how so this says what uh, what part of the background to draw now I'm confused <laughs> it's basically extracting these two clip out the um, I guess I could just jump over here to blit kind of refresh on it where's blit display draw so it should be under display knit Is it under display? Is it under surface? Okay, surface blit. Draws the source surface onto this surface can be positioned with the destination argument can be either a pair of coordinates representing the position of the upper left corner of the blit or a rectangle where the upper left corner of the rectangle will be used as a position for the blit. So that's what this is. It's picking the position so it's going to go onto our background and pick that you know it's just like how it painted the player but now it's going to paint just that part of the background there and since the background coincides with the screen background that should be the same and then for how much of that background do we want to actually paste and you know blit in we don't want to we want to do as little as possible but enough to cover everything up that we need to erase so that's what the second position is going to be for an optional area rectangle can be passed as well. This represents a smaller portion of the source surface to draw. So that's what this is doing is it's saying, hey, just just do that little player sized piece. Okay. And so now if we run it, this should run um, even smoother maybe. I do have that frame rate limiter set on so it might not be noticeable. Oh. <laughs> Did something wrong there. So what am I doing wrong? Okay, the position, it's it's out of sync. Like the position's getting moved forward down here. Um, this background needs to erase the old position. So in order for it to erase the old position, position dot move, we can do all this position dot move stuff up above. So position dot move, 
And then if we're moving, we better check and make sure that it's okay to move where we move to. And then after we're done, maybe that'll work. Let's see, I'm not even gonna think about it too much. I'm just gonna hit go. Still not working. Maybe I do need to think about it. Okay, let's look at what's going on here. So we're coming into the loop, everything looks fine when it starts, and then it's gonna say position, move in the direction, one, and all that. So what's going on here is what's really wrong. So we need to blit this before we move the position. You're probably way ahead of me on this, that's good. Something, well, I guess I can leave that out. Um, let me see, give it a little test. All right, there we go, back to good. So this is just doing effectively the same thing, right? But now it's only erasing the little, about, you know, the size of the guy, or actually it's more like a pixel at a time. So it is erasing the size of the guy, but Maybe it doesn't need to. Maybe there's another optimization to be had. The best thing to do is just start out simple and clunky and dumb and then optimize as needed from there. Get it working first, then optimize. That's the the motto. Okay, and then maybe you notice too we'd never converted that. So it'd probably be easier to tell all this stuff like if I actually disabled this for a moment and then came back up here. And we'll just put this real quick back to zero, zero. And then we'll run it. So that's with the brakes off. That's pedal to the metal. Um, <laughs> but doing that full background blit every single cycle. So that's not very efficient, obviously. And then if we put that back, to position position now it should be noticeably faster a lot faster and then I don't know with my frame rate if you'll be able to tell how much faster this next step should even be excuse me um, but if we convert that background to the same pixel format as the, uh, the display surface should be even faster. So yeah, it's booking on my screen. I don't know how choppy that is on yours. So that's really, I mean, that is as fast or faster than anything we've done up to this point. And it's also pixel by pixel handling and the best graphics so far and stuff. So that's good to see. And then down here, we can of course put the frame rate back in check and run it one more time. And we see there it's nice and smooth and we know behind the scenes it should be fairly optimal. I mean, of course, there's probably more optimization we can do, but uh, for the time being, you can see here, where's the Python? Which Python is it? Pi game. Yeah, it's only using a few percent of CPU. So that's nice to see. If you know, if it's using, depending on how many cores you have, uh, divide 100 by your number of cores, and you don't want it to be approaching that number ideally. You want it to be ideally just, you know, a few or even, this is kind of maybe even high percentage for a little basic example like that, but not bad at all compared to what we were seeing. And, so does that that pretty much covers that and I, so I just want to give it a quick rundown of what we went over here that has changed or updated or where we're at it's uh, from Pygame import the four modules that we specifically wanted to use this time a little more efficient right and then we're importing the locals so that gave us like quit and key down without having to type Pygame in front of them and of course we don't have to type Pygame in front of display or in front of image 
or any of that stuff anymore. Um, and then we imported sys just for this little six exit command. There's actually like a Pygame quit, I think it's called, but we didn't import Pygame, so uh, what else do we have here? Then we, we brought in these, um, we moved the display initialization above our image loading so that we could convert them to the more optimal format. So we, and we just called display init instead of that uh, pi game init. So we're just initializing the modules we absolutely need to. Set the mode the same. We brought in this clock object so that we could control the frame rate. And then we brought in all these images that are stored in the same directory, converted them to the most optimal, pretty much the most optimal surface for the time being. Um, we are now setting the position with by getting a copy of that player rectangle with all the methods attached we have a little direction flag multiplier thing um, and then we go ahead and initially blit the background this is all coincides over here to this stuff so like create screen that would be this stuff well the frame rate's just one of those initializers, but there's the create screen stuff. The player load is going to be player load um, background load background. This stuff would be in load background if you did create that function. Um, screen blit background that's happening right here, and then position get player rectangle. We did that above, just whatever. Obviously, it doesn't matter. Um, screen blit player position which I went ahead and just skipped so it's effectively probably going to start a pixel over because what do we have here yeah by the time it blitz the player you can see we've already moved at least one pixel so the player will but if you wanted to start the player literally on pixel zero you would do that right here you do a just a, a one-off screen blit with them at um at their initial position and then you'd make sure and call that display update right, right after those two so that it actually showed that. And then you enter into that loop and here they have it fixed. They have a fixed range of for loop of 100, but we just did an infinite while loop right here. And then they're screen blitting the back, while well, we check for if the system exit and then they're screen blitting the background. I should have popped this open for reference to avoid having to get the ordering right on that stuff. And then the position move, we're moving the position. They're moving two pixels. This was done in the early 2000s, so they probably needed to uh, give it a little boost. We needed to actually kind of slow it down. So we're moving one pixel at a time with the frame rate throttling. And then they do this player blit after that, which we do, but we're, instead of using a fixed loop that's just sliding us across the screen once or whatever, we're, uh, we're checking that position and we're bouncing off the edges. And then, uh, screen blit player position which we have like virtually identical right there I prefer to name anything that resembles a constant as like a constant um, and then the display update we have and we don't have to use pi game because we imported it uh, did the from import and then instead of delay you can use delay check that out um, it's a little bit janky you'll notice the the character will kind of hesitate and stuff so on things like breakout and stuff like that when your little ball's bouncing. I remember on DX Ball 1, that game, you could see the ball kind of like have a little like hiccup as it was moving across the screen sometimes. And I think that was because of the way that they were using like their delay. So this one just, in my experience, happens to be a smoother way. I'm not sure if there's a way to, to sync with, uh, do like a V-sync on with Pygame or not. I'm pretty sure there is with SDL in particular. That would be a possible another option. Um, there you have it. That's all the code you need to smoothly draw. Um, and then here they're just actually, since they didn't cover the functions that we just did for all the image load and stuff, they're mentioning those now. And then the handling input, which we've done. And we even actually handled the arrow keys a little bit too. I'm going to go ahead and wait to move multiple images and just go ahead and push that off and do another tutorial because this one's obviously long enough. And then, like I said, don't be scared to uh, come up here and dig into this stuff because, you know, even if, don't worry about what you don't understand, but you can come through here and see, you know, there's event again, you know, there's all this stuff to do with events, read what you can. And if you scroll down past this little 
table of contents thing, it will tell you Python ha Py <laughs> Pygame handles all its event messages through an event queue. And it will kind of give you this nice little fairly concise description. Of course, this is like the longest one I've seen now that I said fairly concise. But yeah, that's, like I said, that's a longer description that I've even seen. And it will kind of explain it to you. And even if you don't understand it the first time, just read it and get a general idea. And the more you kind of kick it around, the more you'll understand it. And you don't need to know, wrap your head around every one of these things. As a matter of fact, I'd recommend not trying to do that unless you're already a really good programmer or have video game programming experience or something. But if that's the case, you probably wouldn't be watching this tutorial. But anyway, yeah, there's a... Uh, there's all that stuff and don't be afraid to check out something new you know maybe if you have a joystick try and add joystick access or whatever just try and do one more little thing or just change one little thing and just get it to do something just a little bit whatever kind of tickles your fancy on that thanks a lot for watching